morning, South Bay. Good to have you guys here this morning. Um, I want to start off by sharing an article that my friend sent me uh, not too long ago. He sent me a link to an article that was called Things That Were Normal in the 1990s. And so I got a kick out of remembering some things from our past. And I want to see if you guys remember some of these things. Uh, how many of you guys remember doing presentations on an overhead projector? You guys remember that? How about, do you remember saving your files to a three and a half floppy disk? What the heck is that, right? How about this? How many of you guys remember, for you gamers, how, how many of you guys remember playing Snake on your green screen Nokia phone? This was like the game to play. This was like high definition at the time. How about this? How many, how many of you girls, you know, I was thinking actually past the 1990s and I started remembering back to the 80s. How many of you girls used half a can of hairspray to get that perfect wave? <laughs> all right? My sister was all up in the bathroom doing that. Um, how many of you guys remember Reebok pumps? Pumping up before that, that big game, getting all ready? How about this? How many people remember the, the relationship between these two objects right here? Right? <laughs> Trying to untangle that cassette tape with your big pen. Big pen was so necessary to have at the time. And finally, how about this for you gamers? How many of you guys remember having to blow on your cartridges to get the stinking thing to work? Right? Actually, there's one more before that. How many of you guys remember when the Lakers were actually good? Yeah? <laughs> They're actually fun to watch, showtime. I was going through all this stuff, and, and I was just getting a kick out of it because a simple picture like this, a glimpse of our past, unlocks all sorts of nostalgic memories. Right? I started remembering all these things from my past, and, and I think that's what the movie Wreck-It Ralph does for us. I think that's why it was such a fun movie, such a successful movie for many people, because as you're watching it, there's all these glimpses of our past and unlocks all these great memories. So if you haven't watched it, I want to show you the trailer, give you a brief idea of what this movie was about. So check out this trailer. I'm gonna wreck it! Fix it, it me I can fix it! Ah! Closing time, last game, everyone out! My name's Wreck It Ralph. I'm gonna wreck it! 30 years I've been doing this. Ah! It starts to feel hard to love your job. I when no one else seems to like you for doing it. Sure must be nice being the good guy. Nice share, Ralph. As fellow bad guys, we've all felt what you're feeling. I'm Zangief, I'm bad guy. I'm Zangief, Ralph. You are bad guy. But this does not mean you're bad guy. Zombie, bad guy. Hi, zombie. Hi, zombie. Zangief saying, labels not make you happy. Good, bad, <sighs> you must love you. I don't want to be the bad guy anymore. Ralph abandoned his game. Where's the wrecking guy? Welcome to Game Central Station. Trains for all game destinations now boarding. Everything changes now. Where's Ralph? Stand by, my Kubernetes is a little rusty. Ralph's gone to hero's duty? Get out of this game, buddy! I got a brand new spirit speaking in this song. Ralph, your game jumping? What's your name? Freaking Ralph. Why are your hands so freakishly big? I don't know. Why are you so freakishly annoying? Alright ladies, the kitten whispers and tickle fights stop now. When did video games become so violent and scary? Are you a hobo? Listen, I try to be nice. I try to be nice. You're mimicking me. You're mimicking me. me. That is rude, <laughs> and this <laughs> conversation is <laughs> over. Wreck it Ralph. Great movie. How many people have watched the movie before? Okay. Good good handful of you guys. 
In this movie, there's this guy, as you saw, named Wreck-It Ralph. He's this bad guy in this, in this arcade game that's 30 years old, and his job is to go around and just wrecks everything, destroys the building, so that Fix-It Felix can come along with his magic hammer and, and make it right, and he fixes everything. And so Fix-It Felix, after every game, he gets a gold medal. He's the hero. And when the arcade closes at night, these characters come to life and they all hang out together and they all want to hang out with Felix because Felix is the hero. Everybody likes the hero. Nobody ever invites Ralph along because why? Well, he's, he's the bad guy. Nobody wants him around. And so Felix, after, I mean, Wreck-It Ralph, after 30 years, is just tired of this. He's tired of being the bad guy. He wants to have friends, right? He wants to be like Felix. And so he tries to cope with this reality that he's, he's a villain, essentially. And so he goes to things like Bad Anon, which you saw in that trailer, which is like a bad guy's anonymous, and they help him try to cope with this reality. They talk to each other, encourage each other. They have this motto, if you watch the movie, they have this motto that they chant together. It goes like this, I'm bad, and that's good. I will never be good, and that's not bad. There's no one I'd rather be than me. And so they encourage Wreck-It Ralph with this, but it doesn't satisfy him. He's, he refuses to accept this reality. So what he ends up doing is he abandons his game, the Fix-It Felix arcade game, and he hops over to another game called Hero's Duty because he found out that in Hero's Duty, there's a gold medallion that's awarded to the winner. And he figures out, if I can just get a gold medal like Fix-It Felix gets, then I will be a hero. I will no longer be a bad guy. I will be a good guy. I'm going to gain acceptance, and I'm going to win friends. So this launches this whole chaotic adventure, hopping from video game to video game, of Ralph on this mission to seek recognition, to seek acceptance. And as as you watch it, I I loved watching this movie because, like I said, it it brought back a lot of good memories. And I think a lot of people identify with a lot of the, the, the old characters and, and the memories of the past, but I also think that this was a successful movie because we identify with it for a different reason. See, because throughout this movie, you see that there's this identity crisis that Ralph wrestles with, and I think those, those themes of this identity crisis resonates with what many of us go through. In life, so I wanna I wanna look at this movie. Some of the themes that that really stuck out to me as I watched it again and I reviewed it. Two major themes stuck out to me, indicating that there is a crisis with Ralph's identity, and and this is what stuck out. First, it was this idea that I have to earn a medal to prove that I'm good, and the second was this: I have to be labeled good to be accepted. And if 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 we resonate with these beliefs, then what I want to do this morning is I want to take a look at the crisis, and then I want to take a look at what Christ says. Okay, so I want to look at the crisis, compare it and match it up with what Christ says. We're going to look at the issue, in other words, and then we're going to see what the Word of God has to say about it. Amen? So let's pray, let's pause, and let's ask God to teach us His very Word. Let's, let's come before Him right now. Father God, I, I pray that at this moment, Lord, that our total attention would be given to you. Lord, as, as you teach us, we expect that your Holy Spirit would, would really be penetrating our hearts, revealing things to us that we need to, to know and understand about ourselves, and especially the things that we need to know and understand about you. And so, God, we just want to declare right now that we are available to you. We are your students, and you are our teacher. And so will you teach us the things that only you can teach? And I, and I pray that for the, those of us in here who are wrestling with this very issue right now, this identity crisis, Lord, that you would, you would just give us hope and encouragement, that you would give us a very good, sound sense of who we are. And I just pray for those of us who aren't wrestling with this identity crisis right now in our life, I pray that you would plant seeds deep within our hearts, God, store up the army of our hearts with your word so that when that day comes, when we do wrestle with who we are and our identity, Lord, you would remind us of what your word says. So we give this time to you, we give ourselves to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. So let's look at that first identity crisis issue. It's this idea that, that Ralph had in the movie that I have to earn a medal to be good. Write that down in your notes, would you? I have to earn a medal to be good. I want to I ask you guys a question, and if you guys would just be really honest, no shame in this, okay? How many of you guys, raise your hand, how many of you guys would consider yourself a good person? Okay, good, good people in here. How many of you guys would consider yourself holy? Okay, You're just a couple of shy hands. How many of you guys would consider yourselves a saint? <laughs> Nobody. Oh, amen. Look, this is what Christ says. This is the word of God. Colossians 3.12 says, you are God's chosen people. You are holy and dearly loved. So write this down. This is what the word of God says. You are better than good. You are holy. You are holy. Write that down in your notes. And that's based off what the word teaches us. This is the truth. You know, Ricky Ralph in this movie, he has this identity crisis, right? He refuses to have that label as bad guy. He doesn't want to be the bad guy anymore. He wanted to prove to others that he was good. I'm really a good guy. And, you know, I think a lot of us want to do that same thing. We want to prove to others or maybe even to ourselves. Maybe you guys are here this morning, you want to prove to God that I'm not a bad person. I'm a good guy. I'm a good girl. I'm a good woman. And I think a lot of times, though, our good deeds and our good behavior and our good works is a response to our bad behavior. A lot of times we'll do good because it's a response to the fact that I've sinned and I'm trying to make up for what I've done. I'm trying to prove that I'm not that bad. I'm not. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. You know, for many years I was really involved um, in my church growing up. I was serving throughout high school, throughout college, got involved in leadership. Then when I was in college, I started to date this girl who didn't share the same values as I did. She wasn't a believer. And so she became a priority to me, a great priority. And so over time, I found myself not going to church on Friday nights when I would normally be there for Bible study and fellowship because there'd be times when there was a football game going on or there was a time when she wanted to go to Disneyland and hang out. And so I, I, I found myself putting church and the community of Christ and God on the back burner because she was so important to me. And same thing on Sundays when I would normally be worshiping at church, there were times when we'd want to go hang out with friends and, and I would choose to do that. And I saw my relationship with God and my priority in, in God kind of drift. And so when we finally broke up a few years later, I looked at my life and I thought to myself, what have I done? Like I've seriously drifted away from God. And, and so when I made that realization, I came back hard. I came back in full force, got involved in church, started getting you know, involved in all these ministries, started a small group with all these guys, which I, you know, I said, I will lead this small group, started a Bible study. You know, I, I would put together these events for guys to hang out together to try to build up the fellowship because I wanted to prove that I never left. I'm still the same Greg. I'm still the same good guy. A few years later, as I was kind of restored to, to, to the, the community of Christ and I was serving again, I was talking to one of the leaders at our church, and he just made this simple observation. He said, you know what I noticed about people here at our church? He said, when they, when they do something wrong and they feel like they've sinned against God, they tend to want to come back and, and just get really involved in church. He just said that simple thing. And when he said that, I realized, man, that is exactly my reaction. That was exactly what I was doing. Because I felt like when I had drifted from him, I felt like I betrayed God. I felt like, like he was mad at me, like he was upset with me. So I wanted to prove to him that, that is not like that, God. I, I'm a really a good person. I'm really a good person. Some of us are in here today, and, and we, we have this guilty conscience. We, we feel condemned, and we want to prove something. You know, in our Wednesday night Bible studies called Dive that we've been having, um, we, we learned that back in the day during the Bible times, the time of Jesus and the time of the Apostle Paul, a lot of Jews had this certain belief. They believed that our life was kind of like a scale, a balancing scale, kind of like this. 
And every time we sinned and did bad, it would go in, in one side of the scale. And every time we did a good deed or a good work, it, it would go in the good side of the scale of our lives. And at the end of our lives, God was going to look at our lives. And if I had more good than bad, then, then I'm overall a good person. I deserve to go to heaven because I'm more good than I am bad. And so they would do things to, to deposit into the good pile in their lives. And so that's why we see in history that a lot of the, the Jews became very caught up with living out the law, which to them, they called it the law. We call it the Old Testament, the law of God. And so if the law said that they had to sacrifice, they would find an animal to sacrifice. If they, the law said they had to observe Sabbath, they would make sure that they protected the Sabbath. If the law said that they had to get circumcised, they would make sure they would get circumcised. So whatever they did, they would do because it was depositing into the good pile in my life. If I could just do more good, then I will clear my guilty conscience. I'm not that bad. I'm good. Problem was that there was not enough good that they can do. There was not enough good works. There weren't enough good deeds to ever truly outweigh a sinful nature. Because by nature, we're sinful. This is who we are. Every day we sin. We sin constantly. There is not enough good that can ever outweigh it. And the problem is that this wasn't just a historical belief. The problem is that this is a belief that's very prevalent today. That many people in this world have the same idea that if I could just do enough good. The problem is a lot of people even sitting in here, you know, some of us would blatantly say, yeah, that's, that's how I view life. That's what I believe is true. And so, some others of us would say, well, I, don't, I wouldn't say that. But, but then we look at our lives and the way we behave sometimes. Sometimes that's how we live. I'm trying to do good to clear my guilty conscience. I'm trying to appease God or please God once again. See, the truth is this is what the Bible says, and I want to make this very clear. I don't want to um, confuse anybody. It, it's not bad to do good. Amen? Can we agree with that? It's not bad to do good. It's good to do good. God wants us to do good. But here's, here's the distinction I want to make this morning. Some of you, I'm wondering, are you having an identity crisis where you feel like you've been labeled as the bad guy or the bad girl? Has Satan condemned you and given you this filled feeling of guilt as a terrible, horrible person? And so that's your motivation for, for doing good. Are we trying to appease God or please God? Well, if that's you this morning, this is what the Word of God says. Titus 3.5 is just one instance of it, but this is the message of the gospel. In Titus 3.5, it says that He saved us. Jesus saved us, not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved you already, not because of your good works. He didn't save you because of your good behavior. Your bad pile is much heavier than your good, but he saved us because simply he is merciful. He is gracious. And the only way we can outweigh the, the bad, the, the, the sin in our lives is to get Jesus Christ in our life. When we receive him into our lives as our Lord and Savior, we accept that he died for my sins. He has washed me clean because he died and he resurrected. When you, when you bring that in, that's the only thing that's going to tip the scales. We need Christ in our life, not because of any good thing you've done, not because of any good work, but purely on the, the work of Christ, the merit of Christ. And if, if you have Christ in your life, the truth is you're not just good. You're, you're better than good. Your, your label now is holy. You are a holy one, a saint. It's the same word in the Greek. You're a saint in Christ. That's why Colossians 3.12 can say, you are God's chosen people. You are holy. I, I would circle that in your notes. You are holy and dearly loved. That's, that's your new label. And, and I, that, I know it's not practically because I look at my life. I've been walking with Christ for a long time. I know practically I'm not holy. I'm still sinful. I still sin. 
Not as much as you guys, but I still do, right? I know that's shocking, but, but, but even still, God looks at me and he says, you are a saint. Your identity is in Christ. You know, you look throughout the Bible when Paul wrote letters to churches. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he opens up this letter. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified. That means to, to be made a saint. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Circle that, holy. That's what he calls them. In Ephesians 1, to the church in Ephesus, he writes, to God's holy people. Circle holy. In Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And as we learned in our dive Bible study, Philippians chapter 1, to the Philippians, to God's holy people in Philippi. And he says it to the Colossians, and he calls the same thing to the Thessalonians. These were all churches that were churches, churches that were messed up in many different ways. There were many things about them that were praiseworthy, and so Paul acknowledges those things. But then there were things that needed correction. There were errors to rebuke. There were wrongs to be made right. There are a lot of things messed up about these Christians, but he starts off every letter by saying to God's holy people, because that's what you are in Christ. Your identity, your label is holy. You're a saint. You're righteous. Does that not blow you away that a holy God will look at us and call us holy? And, and these churches were called that not based on their works. We know that as you read through their letters but based on their faith in Jesus Christ. They accepted his, 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 his forgiveness, his mercy, the fact that he died and he rose. And based on that work of Christ, they're holy. Guys, that's, that's, that's the hope we have this morning. That, that's who you are. God looks at you. If you have Jesus in your life, he says, you're my saint. And I know that even as I say that, even as I say that, it's kind of like, that's, that's crazy, because I'm no saint. No, I think about people like Mother Teresa, like who has given up everything, gave up her life to serve the poor and the needy around the world. I'm not like that. You know, I, I, I was reading about this. Mother Teresa, did you know this godly, saintly character? She is not a saint, in the eyes of the Catholic Church at least, because officially to be canonized as a saint According to the rules of canonization, she needs two miracles to be attributed to her that can be verified before they can officially call her a saint. So this woman who has given her whole life to serving God and people can't take on that title. That's crazy to me because I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't plan on doing any miracles anytime soon. I don't know if I'm going to be able to raise anyone from the dead anytime soon. And yet, that's my title in Jesus Christ. And you know what? I believe Mother Teresa is a saint based on her faith in, in Jesus Christ. I don't need anybody to tell me otherwise because the Word of God makes that very clear to me. That, 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 that blows my mind. It's just incredible that a holy God would, would call me that. You know, one of my favorite teachers and uh, speakers growing up when I went to uh, church there is this guy who we loved so much. We admired him. We would invite him to all our retreats to come and speak, and he would speak at all these conferences. And everybody in my church loved his teaching. We'd always talk about the things he taught us and the things he said. He's just like a, a role model to me. And a few years ago, I'll never forget when he called me on the phone, and this, this, this was so humbling because it's not like we were buddy buddies. We didn't chat. You know, we didn't talk. I didn't know how he got my number. But he calls me and he says, hey, Greg, I'm leaving my church. I'm stepping down. And he says, they need somebody to take my place. He's like, you're the first person I thought of. He's like, I think you would be the perfect fit. He said, you're such a great communicator. And I have to, to say, I, that, that rocked me because he had never heard me communicate or speak. And so I don't know where his grounds for saying that was. But the fact that this guy, the very thing I admired him for and looked up to him for, he was attributing that to me. So can you imagine what that did to me? That was like, oh, are you kidding? That's, that's so humbling. You know, in our, in our Bible studies, I, I talked about this guy. In 2012, People Magazine said this guy was the sexiest man alive, Channing Tatum. 
Apparently, ladies love him. I think he's all right. But um, imagine if Channing was here in our service this morning, and he's, he's listening, and then after service, he's just waiting for me down here at the bottom of the stairs. And he says, he says, Greg, as you were speaking, I couldn't help but to think, man, you are sexy. <laughs> they say, I'm the sexiest man alive. No, Greg, you are fine. You know, you know how I would respond? I'm like, oh, Channing, Channing, are you serious, me? You're calling me the sexiest man alive? That's humbling that you would say that of me. And, and I think about it because a holy God, a morally pure, totally righteous, perfect in every way, has no hint of sin in him, would look upon me, would look upon you, and say, my holy one, you are my saint. Does that, does that not blow you away? Is that not incredible? Does that not humble you? That a holy God would identify you as just that very thing that we see in him. And I'm telling you, that's because our identity is in Christ. It's because of not anything you've done, but because of the work of Christ. Amen? Amen. Can we, can we just praise Jesus? That is so worthy of worship and praise. So that, that's the first crisis we see in the movie. Here's the second one I noticed, and you might want to write this down in, in your notes. It's this idea that Ralph had that I have to be labeled good to be accepted. And here's what Christ says. This is what the Word of God says. You are accepted. You are accepted, and you're labeled as child of God. John 1.12 tells us, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, who believe in Jesus' name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's the word of God right there. I reckon Ralph, he, he was trying to get his label changed. Why? Well, not just simply to be a good guy, but he felt if I could change my label to be a good guy, then what's that going to do for me? Well, that's going to win me friends. That's going to gain me acceptance, just like Felix has. And so his ultimate goal was to feel accepted, to be recognized by everybody else. And so that sent him on this crazy adventure to get that, that new label. You know, for, for him, his whole identity was attached to his label. The truth is, all of us in here have labels, don't we? We all have labels. People label us by what we do, what we achieve, what we possess. People label us by what kind of job I have, how much money I make, what kind of education I've, you know, received. People label us by how I look, how I dress, how fit I am, or people label us by how godly I am, how spiritual, how involved am I in church. We all have labels, like it or not. And Ralph, he, he, he was sold on this idea that his identity was in this label, and that a certain kind of label, therefore, would gain him acceptance. For him, it was the good label. And we've been sold in the same way on the idea that certain labels will gain for us acceptance. If we can just get that label or maintain this label, then I'll be accepted. I'll be recognized by people. But here's the problem. I want you to write this down because this, this is just a truth. This is reality. What is accepted is always changing, isn't it? What's accepted and recognized will always be changing. See, when I was in high school, um, many of you guys know I went to West High right here in Torrance, and I remember uh, as a senior in high school in, in 1998, a lot of us had our permits, not everybody had their license, very few of us had cars, but my friend rolled up one day in his brand new 1998 Honda Civic. And that was like the car to have back then. If you had a Civic, you were like so gangster and it was cool. That was like the car for an Asian high school guy to drive, a Honda Civic. And so when he rolled up, man, he, it, was all, it was suddenly like, you are so cool. He, he, he immediately got this label, cool Asian guy with a Honda Civic, right? <laughs> 
I mean, not that anybody, like, called him that, but that, that's just the label we put on him. And he was just accepted. People liked him. People called him up. They wanted to hang out with him, go places with him. But what's accepted is always changing. Can you imagine if we had a high school reunion this year? And, we, you know, 15 years later, we all come back together and we all show up at this, at this uh, venue and, and he comes rolling up in his 98 Honda Civic, right? Everybody else would be like, what a loser. Why, why are you still driving your 98 Civic? Now, if you have a 98 Civic, no offense. I'm not knocking you, okay? The point I'm making is what was cool and acceptable 15 years ago isn't necessarily so cool today unless you change. You're not the cool kid on the block anymore. And so if that's true and we're building our lives upon these labels people give us and we're, we're attaching our sense of worth and value to these, these labels and this identity then we're going to find ourselves in a constant state of chaos and change. We're constantly chasing after the wind. We're trying to gain acceptance and then maintain acceptance. And then we're trying to gain acceptance and maintain acceptance. And we're going to find ourselves crashing and burning. We hit bottom. We get depressed because it's just a chasing after the wind. We suffer identity crisis because we let these labels define us and assign worth and value to us. It affects your behavior, and sometimes it just gets ridiculous. When I was in high school, I'll never forget second period. is trigonometry class with Mr. Clark, and I was just talking to this friend of mine in class, and just having a simple conversation, and she says something to me that changed everything. She, she said to me, she said, Greg, you know, I just want to say, I like the way you dress. She goes, in my opinion, I think you're one of the best dressed at West High. And when she said that to me, I was like, oh, cool, you know? Inside, I was like, oh, that's like the best thing I've ever heard. And little does she know that that one statement changed everything for me. Because from that day on, I made it a point never to wear the same thing within a two-month span. <laughs> because if I was going to be the best dressed at West High, best dressed people don't repeat their outfits, right? So I, I want to maintain that label, and I'll, I'll, I'll just confess this to you right now that I can't believe, don't tell anybody this, but the way I would make sure that I didn't repeat outfits was I kept a log. I had a literal notebook and every day I would log what I wore on top and what I wore on bottom and I would do that so I would never repeat the same outfit within two months. And if I saw that I was starting to wear the same shirt or same top within a two-month span, that was indication to me, it's time to go to the mall and I have to get some new clothes. And, and I, I did that just because I, I needed to maintain this, this image. I needed to be accepted by these people as the best. Now, she was the only one who ever said that to me, so it probably wasn't true. But that, that's, that's, that, that was my identity at that time. And, and I look back on those years and I think about what I did and I can't help but to think that was so dumb <laughs> why did I do that why am I telling you I did that you know <laughs> uh, it's so dumb and then I think about how it affected my life it affected my self-consciousness it affected my decisions it affected my wallet right my mom's wallet I mean I was broke I didn't have money but I look at it and I wish I wish I didn't let it affect me so much. Some of us, unfortunately, a few years down the road, we're going to look back to this day or to this time, 2013, and we're going to look at some of the labels we're, we're chasing after, trying to gain, and we're going to think, man, that is so dumb. Why, why did I let that affect me so much? And so I want to encourage you guys right now, think about this. How do people label you? What labels are you trying to gain? Or what labels are you trying to maintain? And I'm seriously asking you to think about that. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you right now because we need to be conscious of that. Because we find ourselves building our lives upon these labels, this identity that people assign to us. And affects the things that we do and the way we live our lives. And sometimes it's just dumb. See, we could build our, our lives on these labels, or we can choose to build our lives on what God 
says about us. We can choose to, to, to live in a way that, that, that feels accepted by the world or we can live in a way that is acceptable to God. Because the world will say you got to be labeled as pretty or you got to be labeled as successful or you got to be labeled as rich or you got to be labeled as, as holy. You got to be labeled as spiritual in order to be accepted around here. And God says, no, listen, this, this is my word to you. You are accepted already. You are a child of God. You are my child. John 1.12 reminds us of that. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who have believed in his name, Jesus' name, he gave the right to become children of God. Guys, if we have Christ in our lives, our identity is in Christ. And because of Christ, you are sons and daughters. You are loved intensely. You are loved deeply by the one who truly matters most. Our Heavenly Father, you are loved by the one who is crazy about you. So much that he would pursue you from heaven, from heaven to earth. And that's eternal. We're sons and daughters of God. You know, my son Evan, he started school this year. And my wife constantly tells me that, that it is a highlight for Evan that, that I, his daddy, takes him to school and picks him up. She says he always talks about it, and he says it so proudly. Daddy takes me to school. Daddy takes me to school. And, and I love it because every time I go and pick him up um, around 5 o'clock, you know, there, there's this room where all the kids are playing together as they're waiting for their parents to pick them up after work. And, and I walk in that class, and I've seen these kids, and some of them are really cute kids, two-year-old, three-year-old kids. And some of these kids are actually really well-dressed for two-year-olds. And some of these kids are really well behaved. And some of these kids are so funny in the way they act. But you know what? None of that matters when I show up at 5 o'clock. I, I call out and I say, Evan, Evan. And all the kids will look at me because they hear me. But only one will stand up. And only one has this fat smile on his face. And he runs to me and he hugs my leg. He hugs my right leg and he just holds me. And he says, Daddy, it's the one who has identified me as his father. And I've identified him as my son. It's my child. It doesn't matter all these other characteristics, how good he is, how smart he is, how well be. He's my son. That, that's embedded in his identity. That's never going to change. See, because there's going to be a time as he grows up and goes through school that he, he may be the smartest kid in class one day. Or he may be the 35th smartest kid in class out of 35, right? <laughs> I hope not, but there might be a day when he's the most popular kid in school, and there's going to be a day where I'm pretty sure he's going to feel unloved and unaccepted. There's going to be a day when he might be the athletic, most athletic kid in his grade, and there's going to be a day when somebody just runs faster than him and jumps higher than him. But there will never, ever be a day, never be a day where he's not my son. There's never going to be a day where I fail to let him know that he's loved no matter what. It doesn't matter how he compares to other people. There will never be a day where I fail to assure him that he is accepted in my house. He is loved and welcome into the, the household. And that's what we have in our Heavenly Father. When our identity is in Christ, our label is not just you are holy. Our label now in God's eyes are you are sons and daughters of the Most High God. That will never change. And when people's opinions of us, when their standards of acceptance of us are fickle and temporary, when people's, you know, identities that they give us are always changing our God, He never will. He will always be our Heavenly Father. We will always be His sons and daughters. And that's not because of anything we've done, but that's because of the work of Christ. We have a place forever, eternally, in the household of God with our Heavenly Father. We get to enjoy Him forever. Our identity is in Christ. You are holy and you are child of God. You are accepted already. Now, I want to close with this. 
you know, Satan wants to do that very thing to us. He wants to confuse us with, with, with these labels. He wants to confuse us with feelings of guilt and condemnation. Whatever it takes to get our focus off of Jesus. He wants to take our eyes off of Jesus and get us to be worried about ourselves. You know, four, four years ago, Monica and I got married. We celebrated our wedding anniversary this past Thursday. It's been four years together. And I was thinking back, I was thinking back to our wedding day. You know, in anticipation of that day when we got married, I, I felt, I think I'm going to cry when I'm standing there at the altar. What actually happened was I cried like a big baby, okay? I'm not yawning there. I'm actually wiping snot from my face. I'm so glad our photographer got that moment. But I was crying. I was so emotional. And as I was standing there at the altar, even as the bridesmaids were coming down the aisle, I was, I was just like, oh, man. I was getting so emotional inside. And by the time the maid of honor made her way down, my, my wife's best friend was coming down. I just lost it. I mean, it looked so bad that this other woman was coming down the aisle. I'm like, ah! but but I, I lost it because I knew what was next. I knew next would be my bride. And so after the maid of honor came down, the doors in the back closed very briefly, and then they opened once again, and boom, my bride was standing right there. And at that point, I just went, I just became undone. I was a wreck. Here's the thing, though. When she came down that aisle, she didn't cry a single tear. I mean, girl was Iron Man. She was like, boom, 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 boom. She was like in the zone, you know? She wasn't emotional at all. But she'll tell you why. She'll tell you why. Because it was advised to her before that day. She, they, they told her, whatever you do on your wedding day, when you're coming down that aisle, don't look at Greg. Don't look at your groom because you will become overwhelmed. Quite naturally, right? But they said, no, you'll become so emotional, you'll start crying, your makeup's going to run, you're going to be ugly, and you can't be ugly on your wedding day. You got pictures to take, you got hands to shake, you got people to hug. This is your day, girl, you got to shine. So distract yourself. Distract yourself. So they told her, instead of looking at your groom, look at his tuxedo. Fix your eyes on his chest, and you won't lose control. And she did very that, that, that very thing, and she just came down in the zone. Now, I want to say this. The Word of God says that Jesus is our groom. The church, the believers of Christ are his bride. And when Satan tells us, hey, be distracted, be distracted, I, I want to say no. Hey, let's, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's fix our eyes on the lover of our souls, and let's be overwhelmed by what we have in him. Let's be overwhelmed by this God who loves us so intense, so intensely and so deeply. When Satan wants to say, you are condemned, you are guilty, you are a bad person, let's be overwhelmed by the fact that he looks upon us and he says, you are holy, you are righteous, your identity is in me. When, when the world wants to distract us, you got to be a certain person, you got to have a certain label, let no. Don't be distracted. Let's be overwhelmed that in Jesus, God says, you are my sons and you are my daughters. And that's because of what we have in, in him. Jesus, our identity is in him. Amen? So because of Christ, we don't have to have this identity crisis. But our identity is now in Christ. Will you guys pray with me?
God, it's just so overwhelming what we have because of the work of Christ on the cross. That when we're so affected by the lies of the enemy and the labels by other people, Lord, that, that we have Jesus, that our identity is found in you. I thank you so much that you have made this gift available to us today, this relationship with an overwhelming God. We thank you. I want to make an invitation to some of you guys today as you continue to close your eyes and your heads are bowed. Some of you guys are standing here or sitting here today and you, you, you feel like you're guilty. You feel like you've been condemned. You feel like you've been labeled as the bad guy. And then there's some of you guys who feel like you have been chasing after the wind. You, you're trying to gain these labels and this feeling of acceptance. But I, I just want to invite you right now to give your life to Jesus. Because the old has gone and the new has come when we give our lives to Christ. Our identity is now found in Him. We are holy. We are saints. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And that's an eternal thing. That's unchanging. Our security, our worth, our value is found in Jesus. And so if, if you want right now in this moment to give your life to Him, to get Him into your life as your Lord and Savior, will you just pray this prayer with me? Let's pray. Father God, I know I sin. I know I don't act like a saint. But thank you so much for Jesus Christ. I believe that he pursued me to die on the cross for my sins so that I would be forgiven and washed clean. And I believe that he rose from the dead and now is my Lord and Savior. So will you forgive me of my sins, come into my life, Help me to walk every single day with you. Help me to give my life to you, walking with full confidence that I am righteous in your sight. I am a son. I am a daughter of the Most High God, no matter what anybody thinks or says about me. God, I thank you. I rejoice. I celebrate. And Lord, we just give praise to you for that very truth that comes not from man, but from your word. We just want to worship you. We celebrate you because we love you. We're overwhelmed by how good you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.